Early in tonight's debate, Bernie Sanders declared that we cannot be consumed by Donald Trump. At which point, Rachel Maddow went up to Bernie Sanders, grabbed him by the collar and said, Dude, shh, without him, we got nothing. Joe Biden mentioned that the impeachment hearings taught him that Vladimir Putin doesn't want him to be president. Hey, he's got that in common with most Americans. At one point, Amy no. Klobuchar mentioned that she raised $17,000 from ex-boyfriend and was immediately canceled for slut-shaming herself. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren spoke repeatedly about her two-cent wealth tax, which further infuriated big business, who is perfectly happy paying zero cents in taxes and would like to continue thinking... Would like to continue doing so. Thank you very much. So it was a funnier joke. I probably would have said it better. Uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg declared that he's the least wealthy person on the stage and was narrowly murdered by a light that uh, stagehand dropped who was earning minimum wage. See, that's another one that I didn't I, I didn't write it right. That's so that's on me. Wage, that one's on me. I didn't write it well. <laughs> But I'm going to read this last one good. And finally, in his closing statements, Joe Biden said there has never been a time when we as Americans have set our minds to doing something and we haven't been able to do it. Uh, say what now, said millions of Vietnam veterans? The Trump Report starts now. <laughs> I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to After Buzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Welcome to the Trump Report. I am Christian Blatt. This is uh, one of our debate night specials. Debate number five. Christian Blatt here, joined by the wonderful, the talented. I usually throw lovely in there, but you know what? You are lovely. <laughs> Scott Moore. I am. Thank you. Thank you for it's being great. here tonight. It's great to be here. And uh, you basically covered the whole debate the, yeah, and the jokes right there. So I think we're good now. Yeah. All right. We good night, everybody. All right. Good Thanks night. Thanks for uh, being here. No. <laughs> Uh, well, let's uh, let's go big picture first. Mm -hmm. Overall, feelings about the debate, good, bad, indifferent. I, I would say me personally indifferent um, at, and at large. I, I don't think that anybody's performance tonight was really going to move the needle for most uh, voters that were tuning in. I, you know, there might have been a few people that were maybe – kind of not sure who they wanted to vote for. And then they saw everybody tonight who overall had a solid performance. You know, there were some gaffes with Biden and I think uh, Tulsi Gabbard. But overall, I think if you liked your candidate, you know, you're, you're going to continue supporting them. You didn't see anything that was really going to upset you. If there were a few people that were on the fence and they thought, OK, well, Cory Booker had a better night, for instance, than he's had in the past. I think Kamala Harris had a good, decent night tonight. So there could have been a few people there that will be more likely to maybe vote for those or keep them in the running a little bit longer. But overall, I think big picture, it's not going to change much. But I do think everyone pretty much more or less had a very solid night. And I think they did a good job of more or less also sticking to the issues and not really being as angry in their fighting as they were in the past. I mean, we saw like Mayor Pete in the past try to kind of uh, be a little more bitter towards Elizabeth Warren, you know, when she was the new front runner. And I think most people saw that didn't work well for him. So he kind of went back to his right. normal kind of Mr. Rogers-esque, he had a very like friendly center of the road kind of guy. Um, so he kind of went back to that, but I think he still did a good job of sticking up for himself and pivoting and kind of fighting back when he needed to. And I think overall everyone else did pretty well too. And I think Biden had one of his best nights until the end when he had a pretty major gaffe. But considering it's Biden, I think he had a pretty good night too. Yeah, no, when you reference Tulsi Gabbard making a gaffe, was her gaffe just showing up and being on stage tonight? <laughs> was was that the gaffe? Or? You know, well, you know it, it, she was the only one that I kind of felt to, besides you know some very specific moments, just in general, I thought that she came across a little more bitter and, and angry. And um, I, I understand some of her points. Like one of her points was about the establishment Democrats. Uh, you know, and you can go back and look and you can think of, some people that didn't quite win, but the established Democrats like Hillary and John Kerry and Al Gore and some of the people that are very entrenched in the party and are still, in her opinion, continuing on the, the military industrial complex and, and aren't much different than Republicans when it comes to those things. Um, but I think the way that she went about it came across bitter and having now really nice sound bites for Republicans. Yeah. You know, more or less when she was saying about the Democrats, uh, tonight and saying they're they're not for the people and uh that's going to be a great attack ad for someone in uh down the road for not even just donald trump but for someone running in in a, in a swing 
state or a swing district uh, next year, too. Yeah, I did think she made an interesting point when she talked about foreign policy mm-hmm. and she referred to it as the Clinton, Bush, mm-hmm. Obama, Trump, and basically right. pointing that, like, you know, it's not really that different. Right. You know, it, it is really this sort of approach. And I, I don't think most people would say that, you know, I mean, not no. on that stage. They're not going to no. say that, like, oh, yeah, we've had this. Because if you're going to go back to Bush 41, that's more than 30 years, you mm-hmm. know. So it's like this is what our approach has been. So uh, I, you know, I thought she made a couple of points, but it's just it's always it's always in the presentation. There's something mm-hmm. about it, and uh, I was surprised that she was back on the debate stage because yeah. she had not qualified, and right. she has again. And right. we were talking right beforehand that. Cory Booker has not qualified for the next one, but he's here. Mm-hmm. And yet you and I both thought he'd run out of money. Like we right. thought he actually said that he had he had to not continue. Well, he did. I think one. it was in the I think it was the September one, not the October one. Right. But the September one where he said basically if I don't get enough money or support by the end of the month, I'm basically out. So he's been able to hang on. Now, you know, it the stakes are just gonna get higher and higher because now it's instead of three, you know, it was two percent and three percent, now it's gonna be four percent in December. Uh, in four different polls, and you know, the money issue too. So it's it's going to be harder than after that. Now we go into 2020, and now the stakes get exponentially higher because now you're rolling right into actual voting um, in the state. So this this next one is going to be different, and this might have been the last one where we're going to see, I don't know, as, as friendly overall with everybody because I think people are going to have to differentiate themselves a little bit more. I hope they don't get as angry as we've seen in some previous debates and they're still able to keep their cool but really i think this could have been the last debate where we're going to see that because now the stakes are going to be much higher for these candidates if they're going to try to stay in here yeah they're going to try forward. and get actual votes mm-hmm. yeah and it's interesting because we've seen this before where you you see someone target somebody who's maybe not the front runner like tulsi mm-hmm. gabbard had some very specific stuff for mayor pete right and the like back and forth was so much you know i was like Ugh, you two get a room i mean i don't know <laughs> what they would do in that room the two of them, <laughs> right but, but maybe have a pillow fight but whatever yes. it was it was like enough already and uh you know i mean obviously there's there are there are people that and look you know if we know that Pete is uh, Mayor Buttigieg is mm-hmm. polling, you know, as, as first in Iowa. They all know it too, right? And I think that you know, I was talking to somebody about Iowa earlier today because it's a caucus state. Mm-hmm. It you know, it, it's not a good indicator of who no. the nominee will be and who the president is. And I have a friend who he lived in Nevada the last uh, presidential election, and he was explaining to me what it was like. I mean, I, I sort of had an idea, mm-hmm. but it's like if in the precinct that you go to for a caucus they're and and they're not people who work for the campaigns because they're not right. allowed to do that right but if somebody is a supporter mm-hmm. of someone and they're they make some really good points you're like well that's not who i was going to vote for yeah. but you know what i am going to vote yeah. for her. so it, it'll be interesting to see like i don't i don't think i feel like iowa was one of those ones that trump didn't win you know i feel like it was one that bernie won but you know this is yes. just i could have googled this but i forgot no, that I was but to talk about it but I mean, you go back and you look, and and like Rick Santorum won, I think what mm-hmm. was it in twenty twelve or yeah, or I think whatever. you're right. Yeah. Um, and 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 again, in just in general, the makeup of Iowa doesn't really represent the rest of the country as well either. It, you know, it skews a little bit older and very white. Um, and so a lot of the voters there on the Democratic side are a little bit more moderate to liberal. So it doesn't quite, you know. So it, and, and the same thing with New Hampshire. I mean, it's the same thing. It's very very white and uh, and skews older. So it's not representative of, of the rest of the country. And so what's going to be interesting, especially in those first couple races, as everyone was seeing at the debate stage tonight, is, you know, you could have a very close race with Mayor Pete and, and Bernie Sanders again, Warren and Biden, those four in the first two states. But then you look ahead to South Carolina a week or two later and then and then on to Nevada and you see there's more diversity there. And it's very, very different. Like Biden's way ahead right now in Nevada as well. But I mean, in South Carolina, we were talking about this a few minutes ago. I mean, yeah. he's. 40 points basically ahead of second place almost you know 35 yeah, 40 mean, points it's it's not even close they did a breakdown on msnbc mm-hmm. after and they said that in south carolina biden was polling amongst black voters 44 mm-hmm. percent, and that's just like it's insane that it's yeah. that high I and, mean, and with, with any segment that you were right you know, and even with white voters he's he's steadily had to not quite as much but still so if you take away a lot of his support even if some of the black voters tonight were like okay we're sick of his gaffes at the end of tonight, you still ha- he still has so much support there. 
And so that's where th this race could be a little more prolonged on who's going to end up being the front runner, the real front runner, when you have three or four candidates right now that are very close in that first place position. And it's sort of like a race. And you're going to see in a car race, like after yeah. all the laps, who's going to be around that's going to be around and who's going to sort of crash and burn or who's going to just <laughs> kind of keep the, you know, the momentum going with, you know, one, two or three right there in, in a bunch of different states. So I don't know if tonight's debate overall is really going to change that for most people. I just think overall it was very solid and not a lot of gaffes by everybody and people are that are already supporting a candidate are going to be like, great, they did good. And then maybe there were a few people like Amy Klobuchar, for instance, had, a, I think, had a couple really good moments and otherwise had a solid night. You know, she had like the thing with the ex-boyfriend was a little weird because it came out of nowhere, like yeah. what she was talking about. But I think she had a lot of good things. And she is right when she says that she's one of the only ones that has won statewide in a lot of Republican districts. And she has, if you look at, at the results in the past. So it is someone that does bring that Midwest sensibility that could be potentially someone that could challenge Mayor Pete. I just think he's, he's pulling ahead too much now that it, it's probably too late for that to happen. But. Yeah, another thing we were talking about before we got started was that, you know, we're at the point where it's late enough in the campaign, too, where I, I can't believe there's still 10 people on the stage. Yeah. Uh, literally, and I, I made a note because uh, of what had happened, 29 minutes in, mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, Tom Steyer's in this debate? And then they talked to Andrew Yang. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Had no, it's not that I didn't remember him. It's just they hadn't talked to him. Yeah. And, you know, at one point, Cory Booker makes the point of like, oh, you know, there are some topics that we're not dragged into. And Elizabeth Warren has the audacity to be like, yeah, I know what you mean. I'm like, Elizabeth Warren, yeah. I've seen you on TV more I, than I, any right. of the moderators, you know. So, uh, you know, you get most of the questions. And a lot of people had been asked two questions before you got down mm -hmm. to Tom Steyer and Andrew Yang. And it's like, well, if you're not going to ask some questions, like, I know you can't just be like, oh, you're not invited. But well, change what the criteria is. Now, the next one. Right is it's sort of at an interesting point. It's like less than a week before Christmas. Right. It's, it's going to be yeah. on Thursday, December 19th. Mm -hmm. It's a weird and time to I'm have I'm not it. quite sure if or when we would cover it. I think if we cover it, it'll probably be like late morning, early like noontime that Friday yeah. because uh, the studios aren't open as long here. Yeah, and, uh, and the time. Yeah, so I don't there. quite know if we're going to get to cover that. But And then it's after that, it's too. Good, we're going to be in 2020 yeah. because – Regardless of whether we are able to cover that debate the day after or not, mm -hmm. I mean we're you know we're not going to be around those couple weeks for Christmas and New Year's, and when it's actually twenty twenty, I mean that's well that's going to be exhausting. I know, right? You know? It's, not, it's like it hasn't even really begun yet. No, I know. But yeah, I mean, the, just uh, talking about the structural setup of the debate, there were a lot of flaws with that because again, there are too many people. Yeah. And there's not a way to be able to talk to all of them, and, and so it doesn't make sense because if you're going to have ten people up there. But like you said, you're gonna you're gonna wait a half hour before you talk to some of them, and then even when you got to the issue again of healthcare, which is something, I, I, which I feel like if we get into it a little more, I did like what a lot of the candidates said tonight because it was a little bit different, a little tweaked compared to some of the previous debates. However, you only asked I think like four people, so when you're talking yeah, about a, a, on, yeah. a, a, a topic that's so important right now to a lot of Americans. And you're going to kind of gloss over it by only talking to four of the candidates. And then you started getting some other topics as we move further along. And I get they're kind of getting tight on time. Yeah. But you're only asking one or two candidates and you're asking, you know, their quick responses and you're not really able to get that deep. So it's I, I almost wish they would either break it up to a little bit more themed nights and say, OK, we're, these are the topics we're going to cover and then make sure that you're giving everybody either an equal amount yeah. of time or at least say these are the candidates are going to be asked so people know. Um, even the viewer would be nice to have either like a countdown clock or something to be able to tell what what's going on because and it was weird when they're giving rebuttals back to the same candidate that spoke and then someone was you know re responding to that candidate and then that candidate was able to respond back to their response. I was like, yeah. well, why is that candidate now responding to their response? That give it to somebody else to have an opportunity because now you're you're eating too much time. So it was it it was a little weird in that sense, but I think overall. The moderators did well on on questions. It would, you know everything worked fine. You know no audio issues this time. No, yeah, light, you that know, was no, really only the so, first one, which was also MSNBC. Yes, yeah. um, but that's what I was saying. I was bringing it back to that because yeah. of that first one it didn't go as well. So I feel like they did make at least some changes with that, and and the questions were well, and everyone kind of kept to it. But um, it, it, you're not you don't have enough time to really talk to everybody. And it seems like a waste when you have that yeah. many people on there. They kind of people fade in the background. But then you also get the the poor judgment by the moderators and it turned into a great moment for Cory Booker, which is like, you 
didn't ask me about mm-hmm. black voters and voter suppression. Right. And right. he's like, and I have a lot of experience with that. He had yeah. a good line. That he had a like, great line. That I, I've been a black voter since I was 18, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. It was a great that line. That was the only thing that was missing. Yeah. And it was just like, yeah, how can you not ask him? Right. You know? Right. And and that was, uh, and, and I like the fact that he did come back with that good line and he actually came in and said, I'm going to go back to this topic right now because I wasn't asked it. So, again, it was, it was weird that you wouldn't try to ask right. More but the, the thing candidates. that was smart is that he went over his time by mm-hmm. doing that, but they didn't stop it. Right. They're like, uh, well, yeah, we totally should have yeah. let that guy talk about this. Because <laughs> I think they realize what are they going to do now if they stop him because he didn't get a chance to be a part of a topic that yeah. obviously he related to. Uh, I want to divert a little bit from the debate because it was the first topic they got to, which was what we heard uh, during the impeachment hearings today. And by we, I mean people who actually watched it. I yeah. uh, read about it after the fact. <laughs> I saw it on a little bit earlier yeah. in the day. but uh, I did watch I, some of it you here know, and there. there. There are people out there who have had MSNBC on all day from you know before mm-hmm. the impeachment right on through to the end of the debate. Yes. And uh, good for you if, <laughs> right. you, if you can do that. That's, that's no knock on the people no. who are on MSNBC. I'm, I'm actually just, impressed if they were able to leave it on yeah. all day and be that... Yeah, but that's that's impressive. Yeah, I mean, no matter I, what your political yeah, affiliation is. I don't know. I would have had to. I don't know. I would have had to put like a rerun of the office or no, something I mean, in the middle. You know, I, even the hour, even the hour of the debate tonight, I was thinking, oh my god, I still have another hour. And, and I was, love politics. And this was a short one. <laughs> yes, it ended up being like two hours and fifteen yeah. minutes. Some of them have gone like almost three, three. and a half hours. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, so I did want to get your thoughts. I mean, it's yeah. You know, they I think they used the phrase. I think Rachel Maddow said it that this was a this was a bombshell day for the impeachment hearings. Uh, what did you think about just what we heard today? I guess from Ambassador Sunland. I, I think. Well, just what did you think? Before I mean, I said it, I, I, look, I again, it's just where we are in this country, where you can watch whatever media and social media and things that you want to agree with and 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 not have to deal with any of the things you don't which is different than what was even with the clinton impeachment you know 21 years ago right um so you know you could watch fox news and have a totally different perspective of what you saw versus it watching msnbc all day and your perspective um and that's this that's the thing i mean look we most americans know that what trump did was potentially was inappropriate and now the difference is now you're getting all these sound bites and you're getting these partisan sides of asking these questions and and even when i watch it i feel like all a lot of these congress people are doing are just trying to get the sound bite that they can now put into a tweet or put in social media or have someone you know and that's what it comes down to when i'm even listening because half the time you're you're listening to them asking these questions and i'm like they're not really even asking questions they're just going on diatribes going on whatever they think happened or didn't happen. So uh, I, I I don't think the bombshell thing really happened today. Because, um, again, you could have taken on either side because then the Republicans could say, look, you asked point blank if, if to someone if you you know think anything inappropriate happened and they're basically he's saying no or whatever it was, like, oh, it was hearsay again because he, he didn't physically hear right. it because Donald Trump came back later and said to him, like, oh, no, no quid pro quo. And so, again, you, you could say... Either side could have said they won today if you're going to say win. And I think um, there's a way to manipulate it to make either side look like it was a good or bad day for the other side. And, you know, in the big picture, is it really going to change anything? No. And I've said this for weeks. It's like he's going to be impeached in the House for sure. He's not going to be removed from office. But part of the, the strategy that I believe Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats have had from knowing that it was sort of a clear cut case because he's done a lot of other impeachable offenses that Congress could do, but this was an easier one to kind of say it's yes or no and get it through and then make the Republicans have to vote on it in the Senate and know that they have to go back to their constituents, especially people in purple states that have to go run for reelection next year and put them in the uncomfortable position of either supporting him or not. And I think that's, you know, part of it is to bring him and the senators and people that actually have to go out and vote in, 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 in an uncomfortable place. There's no reason that it's really a procedural thing. There's no reason that you can't uh, vote present on that, right? You no. you can just show up and instead of voting for yeah. yes to remove, no I, to remove, you can just be like present. Yeah, I mean, technically, there is a thing where you don't have to, I, I do believe, yeah, there is a way that you don't have to vote on it because if you don't vote on it you're basically saying remove him from office you know like yes you could as a 
as a Republican or not be there. Uh, right, but not being there the is a little day. different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But either way, if you're doing that, I think it gets interpreted that you're basically saying yes, remove him from office. If if you're if you're not going to vote. You know, yeah. it's either if you're saying you're you're not showing up or you're saying president or whatever, then you're basically saying, yes, he should be removed from office. The interesting thing that we got today, which was uh, Sunland mentioned Pence, whom we had not really heard uh, specifically mm-hmm. implicated. So, well, I was going to say he was probably uh, like, hey, what? But it's he was probably not allowed to listen, so mother probably told him <laughs> that uh, he was in trouble. Yeah, and uh, she was very disappointed in him. And then and, he just said, "No, I had nothing to do with you know whatever he said." He denied. I, when I heard Pence's name was mentioned, there's only one person I could think of who would have whose ears would have perked up, Nancy Pelosi, mm-hmm. who's like, "Oh wait a minute, <laughs> can we get rid of both of them?" Right, and she's like, "President Pelosi." Yes. You know, because it's uh, that's all it takes. Yeah, you just got to get rid of the two of them. That's right. That's right. And uh, there, there has been talk that he could be implicated in this. That you know, and that Trump is going to bring him down too, because um, there's no way he would go by himself without throwing every single person under the bus. You think uh, Pence or no Trump? Well, yeah, I don't know that Pence would throw everybody under. No, the bus. I think Pence will throw Trump under the bus if he thinks he can become president. So I, I, that that's going to be the interesting thing too. Would he get to a point where? He would try to throw him under because then he could be president. Pence could be, you know, this was fun. Pence could be the, like, I know that the Senate's not broken up like this, but this is, of course, just hypothetical. Pence could be the tie breaking deciding vote in the Senate to remove the president from office because he, the vice president, is the president <laughs> yeah. of the Senate. Right. And so if for some reason you need one more vote mm-hmm. because, hey, maybe 20 Republicans right, vote yeah. present, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, we're not going one way or the other on this. Uh, so there you go, yeah. and that's that's a that's a good two part episode of the West Wing. I know, doesn't know? it? I make that feels like a conflict of interest too. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's almost like wait, it's like, look, you're, you're removing the person I so mean, that you look, could become president. Like, <laughs> I'm voting to I'm vote I'm here today to vote for who I think is the best person to be president. Yeah, and obviously it's me. <laughs> so uh, you know, look, I'm gonna pardon President Trump after <laughs> after I vote to remove him from office. Don't worry. Uh, and then the other thing, and this was brought up during the debate, was that, and I think we mentioned this last week, to me, the Ukrainian call, all of that, it's very bad. It does, it, To me, it's not that different than politics as usual. Mm-hmm. There might be some, you know, finer subtleties that uh, are uncommon. But the stealing money from your foundation that was supposed to go to the troops and having to, ad, as it was said tonight, admit in writing that you did it mm-hmm. is like... Well, that's so much bigger than any yeah, of this. Right. Why aren't we talking more about that? Yeah. You know, this is like, oh, you were you on the call? No, I was not right. on the call. Have you heard the call? Yeah. No, I have not. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you know about the call? Uh, well, I was watching these hearings yesterday, mm-hmm. and I heard some things that had me concerned. So, I don't know. I, 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 why do you think we're not hearing more about that? Well, we've talked about this a little bit last week, too, is the fact that there are so many other corrupt impeachable type offenses that this president and administration does on a regular basis that it's hard to keep up with them all i mean when you think about even the administration officials and people in the cabinet it's it's mind-boggling how much has been happening and the fact that more of that isn't brought up but that's part of the tactic i think that even before that whole thing with the charity went through was uh nancy pelosi made a bet that this particular impeachable offense out of the other ones was something that was more cut and dry that I think she felt would have been easier to make the case to the American people since the Mueller report was too convoluted and too complicated. There were so many layers um, that it wasn't able to really get out the depths of the corruption of this administration where this particular incident was something that was a little bit more easier for most people to understand. So I think that's why they focused on this. But yeah, I mean, you could go on for days about that and the Mulliman's clause and all the the you know his taxes and and why he's not revealing those and what kind of conflicts of interest does he have, let alone the charity with the two million dollars, let alone all the other administration uh, corruptible offenses going on with cabinet officials, going from Betsy DeVos. You go back to Scott Pruitt, the EPA. You go back to Ryan Zinke in Montana, uh, that then became the the congressman that then be, you know. 
was running Interior. I mean, it just goes on and on. Even Wilbur Ross with the census. I mean, it's yeah. just like, it just goes on and on. So there, it's almost so much that's hard for the everyday American to be focused on it. And I do agree. I think the Ukraine call, as bad as it is, doesn't really get most Americans rattled up it, on a daily like basis. It might be a top five yeah. of things, but it might not. It's right. like, it's probably in the, it's like, I'd say it's in the top 10, but it might not even be, you know, the, the fifth most no, uh, it, objectionable thing. It's wrong and it plays into the fact that this present administration is corrupt, but it's not something that's so damning to where most Americans are going to be like, oh, okay, you know, like there's bigger things that they're worried about. And to me, yes, the, the charity thing is a huge one. And you do feel like that's something that should be brought up more. And that's something that people, that Democratic candidates should be campaigning on as well. You know, it's just the fact that you've got to get rid of this corrupt uh, administration, this corrupt president, and be t- bring up a lot of these things a lot more than they are. I, I do agree with that. I, I've, I was asked by multiple people today, uh, in, including my wife, uh, there's this photo that was making the rounds. And Ryan, I should have asked for you to get this for us, which is the uh, notepad that uh, President oh, Trump had, yes. where uh, he, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that this is what the president is, but the writing was like a serial, not a serial mm-hmm. killer, but like a kidnapper. You know, it's like- In the yeah, Sharpie? It's like this yeah, there like, it is, block yes. print- yeah. You know, uh, my four year old son kind of writes like yeah. that, you know, like not in the lines. And, you know, the, these are his notes. And I'm like, did you need to write this out? <laughs> it's like I, I there was no quid pro quo. And it's like, if you know that there was no right. pr- quid pro quo, why did you have to write it out? Ugh. And. You know, it was mentioned early in the day, the and, White House let us know that he was watching. Yeah. And then whoever took this photo, I mean, that's that should be like the Time Magazine photo of the year. It should be. I, and I, I hope that it's in the uh, like the Smithsonian one day when, you know, when they're talking about uh, this moment in time in history. But it, it, and he writes back, I want nothing twice, which I always thought was weird, too. It was like, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. And he's writing it in this huge Sharpie. Yeah. Font. And I heard, and I don't know if it's true, but there was something, somebody said it's now uh, available as a free font called like Tiny Hand. Oh, I did hear that. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that. So. Uh, yes, was it? Yeah. It's like, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird. It's weird. And it's weird obsession with this and, Sharpie thing anyways. But. Yeah, this is not an, yeah. it, this is not an impeachable offense here, yeah. but this is just weird. Yeah, it's you definitely know? bizarre. It's just like, who, who needs that? You know? It's, Especially something as basic yeah. as what he wrote down too. Yeah. Now that okay. the funny thing would be if somebody else handed him this, yeah, and said, "This is what you need to say." Uh, anyway, so the, they did talk about this during the debate. And yes. I thought that they uh, made a good point about yes. it, and you know, there. I, I think uh, Klobuchar was the one who said that she's not going to say now that, like, oh yeah, I'll definitely remove him from office. It's like, well, you know, let them make their case, which is a fine stance to take. Not a not a particularly popular uh, stance on that stage. Right, though. but I think it was, I mean, great, it was the political answer, but also it is the smart answer, because if you go in right now, because technically they're supposed to be jurors, right? So they're in a trial, and so technically they shouldn't go in with preconceived notions. Of course, we know that's not the case. So for someone to go in on, on, a, on a jury and say, oh, that, that's, this person is guilty before they get to the trial part of it yeah. would be wrong. So even though it's a political answer, it's also really the right answer to say to people to say you're not going in already to say I'm voting that he's guilty and he should be removed without hearing the evidence and having the full trial. Yeah, first. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's answer is the kind of answer you or I would give if we wanted yeah. to not serve jury duty. Yeah, we're like, exactly. oh, yeah, we're d- I'm definitely, definitely voting guilty. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the point is, you know, and that's the thing people forget. This part uh, in the House is not the trial. The trial is in the Senate, and that's when the president can come and bring his lawyers in. I mean, you know, that's where that's where the trial happens. So what we're seeing right now is not the trial portion of it. And so Republicans keep trying to say, oh, you know, we're not allowed to do this or that and whatever. This is just the hearing part of it. The trial is the Senate part. Um, I also like the fact that they kind of tried to go into the subject of, you know, they talked about Ford pardoning, pardoning Nixon yeah. in the debate. And it, it was interesting that, you know, they were very careful the way they responded to that too. And of course they didn't ask everybody, but, you know, Biden, for instance, was like, oh, it's up to my Attorney General and the Justice yeah. Department to decide about charges, and, and and that was a very like squishy way of trying to get out of it, uh, of saying he wouldn't pardon Trump. Uh, but it was fascinating that a lot of people brought up, oh, it's the Justice Department, it's the Attorney General's job, not the President's job. And I'm like, yes and no. I mean, realistically, 
it could be a type of thing like like if Pence was to become president, I would think he would make sure that Trump was pardoned from federal crimes. So yes, a president that is part of the president's job. So it was weird for them to try to say that's not that's one of the special powers that a president has. And so I was kind of surprised they were trying to take that off of their responsibility there in that response that they all kind of said the same thing. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they did. Uh, one of the uh, big moments uh, for the later part of the debate, and it, it circles back to taking an unpopular stance for that stage, uh, Cory Booker referenced the fact that uh, Joe Biden said that he would not uh, not legalize marijuana. Mm -hmm. uh, now, old, old Joe was quick to point out that he would decriminalize it, yes. wipe the records clean. yeah. yeah. And then we'd figure out what to do about it. And, uh, you know, look, Cory Booker, he, again, he had a good line where he said that, uh, I thought you were high when you said it. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was another good one. It was a good line. Yeah. 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 But, you know, and I mean, look, Joe had the the prepared, reasonably prepared answer. I mm -hmm. mean, there's a lot of times in these debates where he starts saying something he stops himself and he kind of takes it a different way, mm -hmm. you know. So he's uh, not as polished as he could be. But despite that, you still feel like he's coming at things from the establishment right. point of view. And I think that that's why people feel like he's the best person to be the nominee. Because he's got the most mass appeal. He's a little bit more middle of the road. Maybe you are going to have some independent, but you know, right of center voters who are like, "Oh yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to legalize any drugs. That doesn't make sense to me." So he, he's sort of, you know, going for the safe bet. And yeah. uh, but you know, on that stage, it it makes him look that much more out of touch than the rest of them. Yeah, I, I, because he did. He basically said, you know, he wouldn't, and, and then he was sort of back. It was sort of a Trump esque. Then that's yeah. where there is a lot of comparisons to Trump because he. He does just say whatever comes in his head. And there were a few moments tonight, too, where he'd start saying something like, I forget where it was, where he was talking about one thing. And then it was going on to the, the social media and tweets about, you know, Donald yeah. Trump. And then all of a sudden he was like, oh, never mind about that. Like he was segueing and then he kind of caught himself. Um, and and it, it's true. That's the conundrum that Democrats are going to have to figure out in the next couple months is which direction they want to go in. Do they want to go in? And a lot of people will say, yeah, go in sort of that safe, moderate box because you get people like the john bell edwards that win in louisiana yeah i wanted to bring um, that up yeah and the and andy Bashir winning in kentucky um you know and that's where a lot of democrats will say well, look we do need someone like that that's going to appeal to independents and to suburban republicans that'll be able to peel those voters away from either sitting on the sidelines or holding their noses and voting for trump again and then you get some on the other side they're saying we need to go in and really just tear everything up and go for bernie sanders or elizabeth warren and you know there's and we'll get everyone motivated to go out and vote we'll get the young people to vote we'll, you know but so it, it, it is a conundrum and it's going to be who can really cobble together that coalition and that's the, that's sort of what's at stake here with the democrats and and who's going to end up pull out, pulling out that win is it going to be someone who's going to be the safe bet and look, a lot of the voters are older voters, and a lot of voters are in most places of the country, outside of the coast, moderate to center right, even as Democrats. So if you want those voters in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Iowa and, you know, a lot of those other states, you really are going to have to maybe look for someone who is going to be able to appeal to them. So that's what's going to be interesting in the next um, couple of months to see who really gets the heart of the voters and who's going to motivate that. Yeah, they referenced Coalition. John Bell Edwards, who just won uh, over the weekend mm -hmm. since our last mm -hmm. episode, yeah. uh, won in Louisiana. And, you know, again, this was another instance where Trump said, you got to vote for you know the other guy because this is going to make me look bad. Mm -hmm. And I don't quite know why he's using his <laughs> political capital in this way over the last couple of weeks. I think because he thinks that people he thinks he's uh, our favorite president, even though he right. hasn't said that in a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and I just like you just like it, especially with well, Andy Bashir is the one who won. That was Matt Matt, Matt Bevin in Kentucky. The, yeah, the, Matt mm -hmm. Bevin's the loser. Right? Yes, yeah. The incumbent who lost. Yeah, re the incumbent who yeah. was voted the least popular governor in the United States. Yeah, so that would make him fifty out of 50. Yeah. See how I did that? <laughs> and so, 
and it's just like, well, what are you doing? Look, I remember Obama going out and trying to, you know, do these things. You try mm-hmm. to push somebody over the top, and then they lose. Right, it's right. just the way it goes. Right. It's but Trump is like saying, like, you gotta do this. This is gonna make me look bad. And right. It's like it doesn't actually make him look that bad, except for the fact that he said it makes right, him look bad. Right. That now you've you've personalized it. But I told someone the other day when we were talking about it because they said, oh, this happens, like you were bringing up. But I said, but most of this happens to a second term president on their way out. Yeah, when people true. are done with you and they're moving on to the next thing, this does not happen to someone in the first term of their presidency that's getting ready to run for re-election. And so that's where I said to people, that looks really bad when you have a first term president that can't even bring people across the finish line in Republican states that are very Republican that you can't bring those people. And then you hear people go, oh, well, you know, like you're saying, Matt Bevin wasn't popular and Andy Bashir's dad was a popular former governor. Right. And so he had name recognition and John Bell Edwards was the incumbent. And you can make the excuses all day long. But if you really look again and it goes to the heart of it again, is the suburban voters in the Republican side have left in droves over the Trump era. And you can see even the numbers that John Bell Edwards had in 2015 when he ran the first time around to where he got re-election, those numbers went way up for him in the suburban areas outside New Orleans and outside of Baton Rouge. And you saw those numbers really go up. And on the flip side, you did see some of those rural numbers go up for his opponent, Respone. But really, when you look at that and then you look at Kentucky again, you see, again, those suburban numbers went way up for the Democratic candidate this time in the, in the bedroom communities of Cincinnati, in Lexington, in Louisville. And so that's where Republicans really should start to feel a little bit nervous when you are seeing those uh, suburban voters that are were always very strongly Republican just leaving in droves and now voting for Democrats instead of just sitting out. So um, that should be a big concern for them, especially when you have a first term president that can't bring these candidates across the finish line when he's personalizing it, too. Right. And John Bell Edwards was brought up in the sense of he is a Democrat, but mm-hmm. he is not pro- really pro-choice. He's well, Let's just say he's pro-life. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, he's passed legislation that reflects that. Right, right. And, and I was disappointed I, in that as a, sure, as a Democrat to but, see that. But. but I did think it was an interesting question mm-hmm. to ask, like, is there room for somebody like that? Like, is there room for somebody who is a little bit more moderate, you know, on abortion and mm-hmm. gun control, you know, like a, like a Democrat who's an NRA member? You know, mm-hmm. Obviously, you'll, you'll run into that in some of those states. And to your point, you do need people like that to win. Mm-hmm. And we're getting way so far ahead of the game, but I feel like for whomever your vice presidential candidate is, it probably needs to be somebody kind of like that. Right. And I I don't think John Bell Edwards has national appeal, right. but it right. is somebody, it, it did get me to start thinking about like, that's really the sort of, that's what you're going to need, I think, to go over the top. Yeah. You know? Right. I mean, in all honesty, do most Americans remember that Tim Kaine was Hillary Clinton's VP? Because it, what, it was just like, oh, it's a guy that kind of says a lot of what mm-hmm, she says. Mm-hmm. Not even saying he was a bad guy. Right, candidate. he was just he was sort just of boring fun. and yeah. just break, you it was know. Just, yeah, it was just somebody else. But it's yeah. like, I had to think for a second what his name was. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I didn't need a ton of time, but I'm like, well, oh, yeah, it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know? And so it, it's like, I think that, you know, look, your vice president doesn't get you elected, but your vice president could cost you some votes, Sarah Palin. You know, I mean, I, I definitely right. think yeah. that, that, you know, that can definitely happen. So that's 100%. something we can look at in, no, but, in, in, you know, the months ahead. But, but that's but. what it goes back to what we're saying, and especially in the debate tonight, like who is who is going to be that candidate that's going to be able to bring those people together, especially in those, those red states that will vote for Democrats. And yeah, you know, again, Elizabeth Warren gave the, the political answer. Again, she had, she always just has a very solid night. She's a good debater. Um, and she said, look, this is what I feel, but there's room for everybody sort of thing in the, in the, in the party. Um, and I, and I get it, uh, but I think that Democrats should be open to people because I, I don't agree with it either, but to be able to, and I'm not saying it's not natural, like John Bowers probably is, uh, pro-life and, and, you know, pro second amendment because he grew up there. And so yeah. you, you are affected by where you grew up and who you affiliate and associate with. But I, I think it is important to have Democrats that might lean a little more conservative. And same thing with Joe Manchin. And there's many times where I'm very frustrated with Joe Manchin and stuff in West Virginia. And there's been many times where I've been very frustrated with John Bell Edwards uh, in the abortion law and everything in Louisiana. But at the end of the day, I would definitely take them over any of their opponents. Um, but it's like Steve Bullock, who didn't make it to the debate yeah, today. Right. But a governor of Montana, who is a Democrat, but also very much you know, supportive of gun rights and everything else. I mean, again, 
that's part of what you need in the party. There's there's different people in all over the country here, and not everyone's going to be a coastal uh, liberal in an urban area. So that's where you do have to feel that you've got to be more open to different types of Democrats, uh, for sure. Uh, one of the uh, the issues that they made a point to focus on, and this sort of speaks to your sort of moderate, middle-of-the-road national appeal, is uh, climate change. Now, I mm-hmm. do think that you're, you're out and out climate change... I don't, I'm, I, 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 when you call them climate change deniers, it, it, it puts a more uh, negative connotation. Mm-hmm. But it's let's just say skeptics. Mm-hmm. I'm not even talking about them. I think that there are people who are like, yeah, I feel like it's happening. But I do think, and we've definitely talked about this before, mm-hmm. I think you start to turn people off when you talk about like, look, we've only got like six to eight years. Right. And then cities are going to be underwater. When you, you When you start to say that, you're like, Wait, really? And not in the way like, oh, really, now I'm scared. I'm like, no, I don't think I believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't remember what it, when the timeline was, but I remember an Inconvenient Truth, uh, the the Al Gore movie, which I actually thought was very well done. Right. There were some predictions mm -hmm. that uh, did did not come to pass. Now, you can point to the fact that you did have uh, the the Superstorm Sandy, where Manhattan was underwater for those few days. But we we got predictions that things like that were going to be, you know, like by now that was going to be a fact of life. And I'm not talking about Venice where it's like – I'm talking about not Venice, California, but yeah, Venice, Italy. Yeah. I realized I had to specify. But it's yeah. like, well, yeah, that that's already like the water's everywhere. So it doesn't take much for that to raise. So I do think – the alarmism you have to you have to play it right as a national issue and i don't think anybody did that on the stage tonight i don't think anybody played it i think they played it for democratic voters for yeah. sure and they're in the primaries that's what they have to do yeah i mean look i don't support tom steyer and but it's a big passion of of his yeah and i feel that at least he brought up because i think part of the way of being able to appeal to more people is saying it's an economic issue and being able to say hey we can do Green technology, he mentioned something about green technology with unionized, of course, appealing to Democratic voters, but unionized jobs, good paying jobs. And I do believe that's going to be part of getting more people involved because, again, the day to day stuff, it, it, it doesn't affect people. Again, if they're not feeling it, they're not seeing it on a day to day basis, then it's not going to affect them and they're not going to really care. So I, the way to make people care is, again, at their pocketbooks and at this point in the economy and saying, yes, we can. We can do some green technology with new companies and new really great things with you know solar power and wind power and green energy and electric cars and we can have new jobs that are going to pay more than you working in a coal mine and so it, it, it's going to come down to being able to convince people that yes economically there's jobs for you and that they're going to be good paying jobs and that you're going to be able to get affordable uh, alternate vehicles uh, you know electric vehicles are going to be cheaper um, things like that 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 will I think convince people to move over. But when it's just an everyday thing, like, yes, the, the sky's falling in 10 years, most people are not going to uh, appeal to that, except uh, people that care uh, tremendously about the environment. And, and most day-to-day things, people, yes, they want to take care of their environment, but they're not going to be putting that ahead of of economic issues and stuff because they're not seeing it on a day-to-day basis because it's such a slow-moving process. But, look, you can see that we've had our hottest years on record since the year 2000, you can look back and you can see every, it's just getting hotter and hotter. And yeah, uh, I have friends that are scientists that do research in Greenland and, and you, they have gone back year after year and they've seen the ice melt. I mean, so there are things in, in the king tides in South Florida that are now becoming a regular occurrence when there's no weather around. So, yeah, things are definitely changing. But to make people really feel it's going to be an economic thing and nobody really spoke to that. I think Tom Steyer s- sort of talked on it a little bit, but nobody else really brought the real scope to that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, I think, at least visualized with the UN thing about the climate refugees. And that is something in more impoverished nations that is, I do believe, will be an issue in the future for you know food scarcity and, and flooding and other disasters that will move refugees. But again, for every day, notice for Americans, they're not going to see it. So you have to affect it more with the pocketbook and make them feel they need to for their own you know, well-being. Right. 
I know that uh, we typically get the same topics in these debates, but Elizabeth Warren did point out that they didn't talk about gun control. No. And now, obviously, uh, you know, tragically, there's always a recent shooting mm -hmm. at, before any one of these, but that, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, were you surprised that they didn't talk about it at all uh, tonight? I was very surprised about that because especially when there was just a, another school shooting out here last week. And then I was also surprised, and again, it's not going to be, a, a, but this is for Democratic voters, but today's the Transgender Day of Remembrance, November 20th. And they didn't bring up, uh, again, the fact that there's been, um, and they brought up in previous debates, like Cory Booker has actually brought it up about, especially trans women of color right. that have been murdered uh, and, and violent acts towards them uh, very disproportionately. Um, so I'm surprised they didn't bring that up. There was a little casual LGBT mentions here and there, but I figured that that would have been a more prominent issue just because of the date. And I was very surprised about no gun gun violence uh, questions, especially because it was a school shooting, which to me takes it to a, a different level. Not saying it's. I, I know what you mean, but, but, that but would it, affect the, the, the story is more, more tragic and people are affected more emotionally. Yes. I'm just talking about the way that people react right. to the coverage of it. When it's a, a, a mall shooting or, you know, a, a festival shooting, mm -hmm. it, it's no less tragic. But it can tug on people's uh, heartstrings right. more. Because most people when, have kids and they're yeah. sending them off to school and they're expecting them to be safe and come home at the end of the day right. from school. They should be safe there. So there, there is a whole other level there thinking, you know, you're losing your child going to school, um, which should be the most everyday safe thing that everybody does. So I was very surprised, actually, and that was on my notes further down that it was not even brought up and and not even the candidates even brought it up as a segue topic so i was you I know was, elizabeth warren saying that it wasn't brought right up i mean but i mean nobody the, else no but I mean, nobody, that was the, that was it yeah, really. yeah but it was it was weird that nobody had really brought it up uh, yeah. more so yeah that was that was disappointing uh, I did think, uh, as we wind down here, uh, in his closing statement, uh, Mayor Pete had a nice reference. He was talking about uh, sort of one of the things that we've touched on tonight is that the party should appeal to what will be former Republicans. Basically, mm -hmm. people who are Republicans, have been Republicans, voted for Donald Trump, and now they're like, oh, yeah, no, no, I can't. I can't do that again. I think the biggest problem will be getting those people to not just stay home because right. uh, we. I was talking to someone in the chat who uh, didn't respond to me, but uh, she was talking about how she uh, was a uh, supporter of uh, President Trump. And uh, I, I was just asking, like, was there anything that he could do that would basically change your mind and, and uh, you know, that you wouldn't just support him? And I think that there are a lot of people that feel that way. But at the same time, they're like, well, I can't vote for a Democrat, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. And especially if it's someone like an Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, that they're like, ooh, you know, because again, it kind of goes back to uh, with the green energy and the climate change is, is healthcare and saying, oh, we're going to force you to go on to government Medicare and you have to, you know, and that's part of the issue with Elizabeth Warren, which I think she did a better job of balancing that out and saying, hey, we'll have a trial period of three years. We'll let you kind of taste it and feel it and yeah. love it. And then you'll want to, you'll you'll definitely want it um, because that does scare a lot of people, even though we all know that healthcare is very dysfunctional in this country, at least, again, big change scares a lot of people. Um, and then you're telling somebody like, no, you can't be on your insurance anymore and you got to be on government. And we all know the government's not great at running certain things. So I think that is a big scare tactic. So if she is the nominee, how are Democrats going to convince some of those Republicans or even independents that skew to Republican candidates that are sick of Donald Trump and the corruption to be able to say, hey, we can put that aside and now we're going to go out and vote for an Elizabeth Warren. And that's where the, the big challenges are going to happen. And that's, you know, just the, the way it is. And I think Mayor Pete did have a good closing argument. And like I said earlier, I think he had a very good night overall. Yeah. Um, I think he does a good job of kind of putting a little bit of the religion in there, which has always been a Republican area. And he's done a good job of being able to have some of those conservative Democrats too, maybe feel more likely to vote for him, especially when you have to go beyond the, the LGBT issues, which could be a concern for some voters. But his big issue, again, is going to be connecting with the African-American voter, which is going to be a huge voting block that you need to go out in full numbers. And they need behind him and right now he's like zero percent in south carolina so he's yeah. got to find a way of going beyond the white uh rich 
voter and try to connect with them. And that's going to be a challenge for him, too. Right. I mean, that's sort of the interesting thing that makes him a bit of an anomaly yeah. is the fact that, you know, he, he does talk about his faith. It's very mm-hmm. important. And he has served in the military. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those are uh, not necessarily what you hear uh, from the Democratic candidates. No. Uh, in the chat, it's a long comment, but uh, dude here uh, is here and says that the Trump dynasty has begun. Uh, I mean, you can say that, but it can, it's not a dynasty in that no matter what happens, there will be, uh, you know, the most that Donald Trump is president is eight years. Yeah. So there's not really a dynasty right. to me, although I was reading <laughs> I was reading on the Drudge Report, and we'll wrap up after this, that uh, I think Robert De Niro said that Martin Scorsese says that Donald Trump wants to start a war so that he can get a third term. <laughs> and I was just like, all right. So Martin Scorsese uh, found something uh, even dumber to say than uh, Marvel <laughs> movies are terrible. Anyway, that's all the time we have for now. Uh, we will be off next week uh, mm. for Thanksgiving. So you'll find us again on Tuesday, December 3rd at our normal time, mm. 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern. We hope to see you then. Uh, Scott, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at sman80. That's sman80. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ and the show at Trump Report ABTV. Uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. Thanks, to everybody, for staying up late for us. Mm-hmm. And we will see you on December 3rd. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. (laughs) The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.